Okay, good morning, everyone. Also, good afternoon or good evening. We have guests logged in from all over the world. So I want to thank you for joining us for the Global Webinar Series. Today's discussion will focus on uniaxial compression best practices. My name is Dan Quigley. I'm the Director of Business Development and Marketing here at DSI. And we know your time is valuable, so we appreciate you spending some time with us. Our goal will be to keep this webinar to an hour or less. Uh, I will virtually hand the microphone to our technical team in a moment, but I wanted to cover just a quick, uh, a few housekeeping items first. Uh, first, if time allows, uh, we will have Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you have questions or comments, please submit them using the chat feature here in the webinar. We've got a few members of the DSI team uh, that may be able to answer the questions directly in the chat. Uh, or if, again, if time permits, uh, we can uh, save those questions for the Q&A portion of the meeting at the end. I also want to thank our team in India, uh, Mr. C.S. Ned Carney and his team at DTS helped us organize this webinar series, and we've had great response from the global community in India. So we want to thank them for their participation. Uh, finally, we want to make sure that we're covering topics that are important to all of you for future webinars. So in a little bit, we'll share a link to a short survey. Uh, please fill it out and let us know what topics you're interested in. Uh, that will help us to decide what to focus on going forward. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenters. Uh, Dr. Brian Allen is our chief metallurgist. Brian will provide a general overview of uniaxial compression testing and then hand it over to Mr. Eric Dietz, who is a system service engineer. Uh, many on the call may have met Eric. He's traveled quite a bit for us. Uh, he'll go through a bit more detailed best practices and operational information. So without further ado, I'll hand this over to Brian Allen. I think Brian, uh, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, sound check, can you hear me okay? You gotcha. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much, Dan, for that great introduction. Uh, as Dan said, I'll be just giving a very brief and fairly uh, simple and high-level overview of uniaxial compression best practices, and I will be followed by Mr. Eric Dietz, who will do the, the bulk of the heavy lifting in this presentation, going through some of the more detailed setup and best practices for setting up and uh, getting successful uniaxial compression testing done on your global simulator. So hot uniaxial compression testing is typically used to develop uh, material properties at high temperatures and at various strain rates uh, for many different uses, but primarily for part design, uh, the development of various manufacturing operations and the sizing of uh, rolls, uh, roll stands, uh, forging presses, uh, things like that. Uh, another very, very large use of uniaxial compression testing out of the Glebal is to develop the information that is needed to develop good computer modeling. Uh, obviously, if you're going to have a good result from a computer model, you have to have uh, good information on the deformation resistance or the flow stress uh, at various material temperatures where you might be working that particular material that you're that you're considering. Uh, another thing that you have to look at is the speed at that deformation, not just the temperature, but the speed, because there is, as we all know, a strain rate sensitivity that is involved in the deformation of materials. There are a lot of other factors also metallurgically to be considered. Uh, work hardening that may or may not occur depending on the temperature and the material that you're working with. Uh, recovery, recrystallization, and grain growth. Generally, uniaxial compression in a global is done in a hot working regime where you do have these dynamic uh, metallurgical things going on. So you are getting recovery of dislocations, recrystallization, and possibly even some grain growth, depending again on the material, temperature, uh, speed of deformation, etc. And depending on the previous history of the material, you may or may not still be have some participation and dissolution that will be occurring in the material. And that, of course, is going to be dependent on the heating rate and the whole time at temperature before you've done the uniaxial compression testing and uh, any changes in the temperature of the material during uniaxial compression testing if you have cooling in the, the edges of a, of a piece of material. And you can simulate all that using uniaxial compression testing in the Glebal. Most of you are probably familiar, but I'm going to go very briefly over exactly how we do uniaxial compression testing on the Glebal platform. Uh, the Glebal is a little unique in that it uses direct resistance heating to heat the sample, 
And when we're talking uniaxial compression testing, that same current that heats the sample also heats the anvils that are being used to compress the sample. So we are sending the current through the anvil, through the sample, and then through the opposing anvil. And that current obviously will heat all those elements in that uh, train that have resistance. Now, typically, if you use a solid anvil, as I'm showing here uh, on the picture on the lower left, you will get an anvil that will warm up, but it typically will not be nearly the temperature of the sample. This is usually because the, the anvil has a larger mass and a larger diameter than the sample, so the, the current density will be lower and it will heat up less. And typically it loses a lot of heat also to the Glebal jaws, so there's a lot of heat leaving the anvil. So the anvil stays cooler and may even have a thermal gradient from the surface where it contacts the sample to the jaws. Uh, this is okay in some instances, but some instances you want a more uniform thermal gradient across the sample. So in order to improve that, DSI has developed what we call ISO-T anvils, which stand for isothermal anvils. Uh, I won't go over every detail on this slide, but it just shows the difference between the solid anvils and the ISO-T anvils. And Eric will get into, I think, a little more of this detail a little bit later. But what you gain with the ISO-T anvil is the ability to have a better thermal gradient in your sample. Uh, on the solid anvils, on the left, you have a solid anvil that's got a lot of thermal conductivity back to the water-cooled jaw, so you can develop a thermal gradient in your sample. And there may be some, uh, there may be some tests that you want that for. The ISO-T anvils use a novel setup to avoid that. So in the ISO-T anvil on the right side, you have an anvil backer, which is in contact with the water-cooled jaw. Then between the anvil backer and the anvil cap, we put a layer or several layers possibly of graphite foil. What this graphite foil does is it does two things. It gives us a thermal resistance. So the heat that's being generated in the anvil cap and the sample does not flow easily into the water-cooled jaw, keeping that anvil cap hotter. And it also provides electrical resistivity, so we're also generating heat actually in that interfacial layer, again heating the anvil cap, bringing it to a temperature that is much closer than the temperature of the sample. And you can adjust the amount of layers of graphite in this to adjust that heat and that insulation in, that, uh, in the ISO-T anvil to closely match what you're getting in the sample. Now, since your samples are going to have different resistivities based on their different sample sizes, based on different materials, you can kind of customize the ISO-T anvil to try to match that uh, that thermal history of your sample. And you, then you also have to look at the heating rates because uh, obviously, as you're putting energy into this, uh, it takes some time to heat up both the backer and the sample. So you have to look at that as well when you're setting up a, a thermal gradient in a ISO-T compression test. The other thing that I'd like to just briefly mention that, that people are looking for when they do uniaxial compression is, is friction. So the end goal here is usually to achieve a uniform deformation. So in order to get a uniform deformation, you need not only uniform temperature, but you need to limit the friction at the interfaces. Because as you compress this sample, it's going to, to, to swell into a larger diameter, and there will be friction at those interfaces. And the ability to overcome that friction will control how much barreling you get in your sample. So to get a, uh, a very good data with a minimal barreling, which means that you have a, a uniform strain and stress throughout the sample, you want to eliminate that friction as well. And, and we've developed over many years and many thousands of experiments some fairly good high temperature lubrication abilities, uh, including some, some nickel graphite paste lubricant, graphite foils, and some diffusion barriers, typically tantalum, that will prevent the sample from actually sticking and you know, uh, making a diffusion bond with the anvil cap, which uh, not only increases the friction, but can also increase wear on the anvil caps and make you replace those more often. So a very high level overview, but this slide just shows that with proper setup of the ISO-T anvils and good friction management, we can actually get a very good uh, uniform deformation in a sample. This sample is a 60% reduction, and you can see a slight amount of barreling there. Obviously, you can never get rid of friction entirely, but this is actually a very good setup uh, result, and this will give you data that uh, essentially you can use directly without a lot of uh, mathematical correction for, for barreling and friction.
So a couple things to think about when choosing ISO T anvils, uh, they are a little longer to set up than the solid anvils. Uh, you do get some interfacial heating at that graphite interface and also at the, the sample to anvil cap interface. Since that anvil cap is higher in temperature than in a solid anvil, that uh, interfacial heating that may occur at the resistance uh, at that uh, sample to anvil cap interface may be a little more uh, critical in an ISO T anvil than it is in a solid anvil setup. Uh, I haven't really talked about cooling rate, but obviously the ISO T anvil is designed to have a limited amount of thermal transfer from the anvil cap back to the water cooled jaw. So you're not going to get the jaw cooling that you can get with a solid anvil. So sometimes you want to look at that cooling rate after deformation and it's convenient to use jaw cooling in that case and you don't get near as much jaw cooling with the ISO T anvils. And the other thing you have to be uh, cognizant of, although it's not really usually a problem, is that there is a little bit more compliance in the ISO T anvils. You've got several layers of graphite and you've also got the lubricant barriers uh, and diffusion barriers. All these add a little bit to the compliance. So looking at, at very, very, very low strains, you do have to be aware that there are some uh, there's some movement going on there that may not be deformation of your sample. Very, very briefly, I'd just like to uh, talk about another way that we have now, uh, have introduced in the last couple years, of doing uniaxial compression testing in the Glebal, and that is the Glebal induction system. So I won't talk about this much, and this is not going to be a focus of this presentation, but I did just want to let everyone know that we do have uh, as induction heating. Induction gives us a couple of benefits. Uh, one, that we can use very different uh, very different anvils. So we can use some thermally insulating anvils such as quartz or silicon nitride anvils that can maybe give you a little better thermal gradient. And uh, we can also use different coil geometries and you can use the, the coil geometry to try to adjust thermal gradient in the sample and get uh, get very good results with our induction heating. We'll probably have another webinar on induction heating, so I won't belabor this point, but I just wanted to, to bring this up. Uh, that concludes my portion of the webinar, so I'm glad to hand it over to uh, Mr. Eric Dietz, our system service engineer, who will get into a lot more of the details. Thank you very much. All right, hello everybody. Um, can you guys see my screen now? It's the same page as Dan's, or uh, Brian's obviously, but. Oh, we can hear you, and I think we can see your screen. Yep, I'm good. Yep. Thank you, Dan. All right. So as uh, Brian said, I'll be talking a little more of an operational level. Um, some of the same things we mentioned though, uh, there will be some redundancies in some of these slides. I'll, I'll go through those things you know, quicker since Brian already talked about some of this. Uh, so I made a brief agenda of what we're, I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about um, anvils. We're going to look again a little bit, going to a few other mentions, like the different material options. Um, a brief mention again of solid anvil versus ISO T. I know Brian already talked about that. Um, I will talk about ISO T anvils themselves. Again, a, a little bit of different information, hopefully, than what uh, Brian just provided, but there will be some redundancies again. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about graphite foil, nickel paste, tantalum, uh, thermal gradient. That seems to be uh, the big question, really, uh, You know how to optimize that with uniaxial compression testing. So we'll, we'll talk about that. So that will be the primary focus of what I'll be talking about. Um, the importance of preloading when running tests like this, which I will explain. Um, the importance or the effect of air and pressure of anvil cooling, uh, a brief optimization study, uh, and then some good housekeeping for it because these uniaxial compression tests uh, tend to be messy if you run a lot of them. All right, so the uh, first item on here to talk about is uh, anvils. So Brian talked about that somewhat. I'll talk a little bit more again. Um, there are a number of options, um, both solid anvil and ISO T, as we just talked about. Um, anvil material, we didn't really mention. Uh, tungsten carbide is the typical one. Um, ISO T is tungsten carbide, both the cap and the base, typically at least. Um, but there are other options. There's tungsten, there's uh, stainless steel, um, possibly other options as well. 
So there's a few different options depending on what you need for them. Um, from the material perspective, uh, tungsten carbide is very strong, as I'm probably everyone here knows. Um, so it's good for very high stress applications. Um, compliance being concerned, tungsten carbide does not comply much. I've, I've tested out myself to very high stress levels and they do not give um, very much at all. Um, but the tungsten carbide tends to um, drop off performance-wise somewhat at higher temperatures. So fire temperature applications, uh, pure tungsten is a better bet. Um, it will work better at the at simply higher temperatures. Um, it is more ductile though. So again, you, you're not gonna have the same performance if you know very high stresses are necessary. Uh, stainless steel, we don't typically use as much, but um, some of our testing in-house over the years has, has demonstrated that it's uh, particularly useful for aluminum testing. Not that the other ones won't work, but uh, stainless steel seems to give slightly better results for aluminum specifically. Uh, solid versus ISO T. Um, again, just a quick mention of the differences there. Um, with there being fewer interfaces, solid anvils will have lower resistance. So as Brian said, you get higher heating, higher cooling rates. Um, ISO T's though are more adjustable. So they're better at optimizing thermal gradient essentially. Um, in cases where cooling rate really is an issue there, you can attach a quench as well to try to make up for some of the, the loss in your cooling rate. Um, so ultimately, which you, which, you know, whether you choose solid anvil or ISO T, it just depends on which factors are most important. If, if heating rate or cooling rate is more important than gradient, then solid anvil is, you know, the, the better choice then. But if gradient matters, ISO T probably makes more sense. Um, that bottom little table I pulled from our uh, specifications, uh, which says that solid tons carbon anvils, 50 C per second is maximum heating rate, ISO T is down to five. You, you can try to go higher than that. You just run the risk of, um, it may not heat as uniformly. You may see kind of more oscillation in your heating. You, it may uh, melt or weld more, perhaps locally um, at the interface there at the surface. So, uh, you know, five C is the recommended maximum heating rate. Uh, again, a little more about ISO T anvils. We're going to talk about this somewhat. Um, and this actually, uh, Wayne Chen talked about some in the uh, in last week's webinar. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, but as Brian already, sorry, mentioned somewhat, uh, ISO T anvils, again, the whole point is we add interfaces, which add resistance essentially to your anvils, which improves the thermal gradient across the uh, the sample. and it's not particularly difficult to alter them as needed to try to find the, the best situation. Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot of adjustability there, essentially. I'll go into more detail about the uh, graphic on the bottom later, so I'm not going to focus on that too much right now. Uh, assembly, just for those who haven't seen it, um, this is pulled from our assembly diagrams, which any user that has um, certainly a hydro edge should, should have this or hopefully um, any ISO T anvil assembly really in their binders. Um, so you can see starting from step one, there's the anvil base in the far left, and then uh, two pieces of, that's intended to be 10 mil graphite. Uh, there are multiple options available, I'll get into that later. Um, so you have your base, then two pieces of 10 mil graphite, then your cap, all of it enveloped in the, uh, surrounded by a Nextel uh, sleeving. Then we have two kind of metal clips that go around it and surround the sleeving and then a, uh, a thicker set that is set perpendicularly to the, the first set. And then finally a clip that almost goes around the entire sample or the entire assembly that just encases the whole thing. And there you have an assembled ISO T anvil essentially. Um, now I just want to mention 
it's just probably obvious, but uh, I figured it, it was worth mentioning that ISO T anvils can be used in multiple setups, not just Hydra Wedge. Uh, it's Hydra Wedge, general purpose MCU, pocket jaw, standard jaws, or compression test adapter. Um, the it can be used in any of those. The different kits are necessary to mount them in the different options mentioned above. Uh, but the SOT itself doesn't change. The, that same assembly shown on the last slide can be used in all of them. That doesn't change. So, you know, a little different setup to start it, perhaps, but um, ultimately all the same practices and, you know, rules will apply to it. On these uh, two images here, I just wanted to point out in each case, you could see a copper disc between the anvil mounting base in each case, um, as well as a graphite disc, another 10 mil graphite disc shown here between the ISO T anvil and that copper disc. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. I just wanted to point them out in these images. Uh, so graphite foil is uh, a lubricant as Brian, as, yeah, Brian mentioned before. Um, so essentially it, it allows material to, to flow during the deformation by reducing friction to try to reduce that barreling again. Um, it's used in a number of places uh, and has potential applications beyond what it's always used for. Um, it is used in ISOT at the uh, anvil base anvil cap interface, as I mentioned when I'm talking about the assembly of it. Um, potentially used behind the ISOT uh, where the base and the copper disc interface, as I just showed in that last picture. Um, it can also be used at the uh, anvil sample interface in place of tantalum or in addition to it, depending again on what seems to work best for you. Um, when used at that interface though, the anvil sample interface, uh, it's not recommended to go really above a, much a, a thousand C, not much more than that really. Um, it's more prone to uh, diffusion there. So you, you have carbon diffusing, you know, in and out. Um, not idea you may end up with, again, localized welding or melting um, effects at that interface, which are not ideal. Um, it also tends to break apart during multiple hits or just, you just, you know, one deformation or so potentially. Um, and then if, it, if it's sheared off, you don't have any more anymore there, so your heating's profiles and probably change a little bit. So not perhaps not ideal there um, alone. Certainly not in all applications, at least. But it's an option. There are a couple of thicknesses available. I just wanted to mention that quickly. Um, we have ourselves five mil, which a mil is a thousand a thousandth of an inch. In case anyone wasn't aware of that, um, we have five mil and ten mil thicknesses available that we provide. So what you have may vary. It's maybe worth double checking what you have. Nickel paste is another item that we use a lot with uh, uniaxial compression testing. Um, it functions again as a lubricant, as a, as a diffusion barrier. Um, as a diffusion barrier, it's the, the nickel graphite compound paste uh, prevents to a certain extent diffusion of the carbon at the sample, at the sample surface. So it's um, especially useful if you're going to do what I mentioned in the last slide and have just graphite there at that anvil sample interface. Um, and that will use at that interface, regardless of what the setup is there, tantalum, graphite, whatever, we, we will we'll use nickel paste there regardless. Tantalum uh, is a little bit different. Um, that is, Another diffusion barrier. Um, it can hopefully prevent welding or melting at the surface, at the, at the interface there. Um, we only really use that at that anvil sample interface. We will not use that, not that I've seen, not that I've tried either, um, at the well, anywhere else in the ISO T assembly. Um, its use in our typical applications is just at that one interface. Um, some of the benefits, though, it, it does not break apart like, like graphite does, and it's functional at significantly higher temperatures than graphite when graphite doesn't perform so well anymore. Um, but as many of you probably know, it is more expensive. 
than graphite foil. Um, so thermal gradient, uh, I know a number of you, we sent out uh, an application note you may already had, but we sent it along um, as kind of a accompaniment to this, uh, this webinar here. Uh, application note 001, axisymmetric uniaxial compression testing using ISOT anvils on Gleeble systems. Um, if you don't have it, you can certainly you know, ask us for it. We can provide it for you. Um, that note talks about basically this topic and recommends altering the resistance at two locations to improve thermal gradient. Brian talked about this a little bit already. So again, we'll go kind of quick through this. Um, it mentions in there, it calls them R2 and R4. So you see here on the right, I have them highlighted. Uh, that's the interface between the cap and base again, which is shown with pieces of graphite foil here, as well as potentially the back here between the base and the disc. Um, again, it shows one graphite foil disc there. Um, those are the two recommended areas according to the app note to adjust to try to improve your thermal gradient. Um, the data in the app note states that uh, R4, the base copper disc interface um, seems to show more or more efficient improvement of the gradient, more effective improvement um, than R2. Um, so take that as you will, I suppose. Um, it also says as a general rule for higher resistance materials, more graphite's needed at either interface. Um, our assembly drawings, just as a reference, kind of a starting point, state that um, R2 should be two pieces of 10 mil graphite, R1's one piece of 10 mil graphite. I don't know if that will necessarily be the case in the setup that you have. So it's, I guess we're checking the hand to get a baseline of you know, what you have. And you know, as a starting point for any optimization efforts you have is you know, this should be as good a starting place as any. Um, another option that we oftentimes will implement because it's just a little bit more convenient than taking apart the ISOT and putting that together and then putting it back in the in the machine is uh, simply altering the stack at the anvil sample interface. Um, so again, most common practice is to put one piece of tantalum on either side, nickel paste on each side of it. Um, but as we talked about, as we mentioned, graphite can be used instead or some combination. Um, the most important thing really, or a one of the most important things in this whole effort is certainly consistency. Um, it's it's key to doing it right. If you um, add graphite on at R2 or R4 at that interface stack somewhere to try to improve thermal gradient, be sure to do it on both sides, or else you're going to have your gradient from you know left side to center of sample maybe good, but then center to right side may be totally different. Um, so it's very important to if you change one side, change the other side in the same way. Um, it's also just general rule to keep an eye for cracked anvil caps. I mean, it, it happens, especially at faster hits or, or more hits or higher stress hits. They, they will, they definitely crack from time to time. Um, and sometimes the base is crack as well. That's, that's worth investigating too, if you have a cracked anvil cap. Um, so in the situation where you find yourself changing the, the ISOT, stack up in any way. Um, whenever you do remove it, uh, the anvil assembly, it's important to, certainly useful to, to preload the, the assembly again before resuming your tests, um, which I'll talk about in just a minute. This helps ensures that you have um, I, hopefully good contact from the anvil mount from the jaw essentially all the way to the end of your anvil and the sample, um, as well as um, consistent compression of the graphite foil and the other interfaces you may have added to, added into the, um, the system, as Brian mentioned before. Uh, so preloading is reasonably simple. Um, what we'll want to do again is once we have reinstalled any anvil assemblies that we've taken out. Um, we just install them, make sure they're not loose, but don't really, don't tighten them just yet. We'll turn on mechanical system, just low pressure, uh, turn the air in and tension to keep it 
press up against the piston, move the wedge all the way in compression, assuming it, if it's a hydro wedge, if not, then just your, your fixed side jaw is where it is. Um, we place the specimen removal tool shown there in the bottom right um, against the, the right side anvil and just move the stroke in compression until we contact that, then recommend letting it go and just letting it sit there. Um, and then turn over to the console, watch the force reading and slowly move the stroke in, very slowly watch the force reading um, until it reads about 20 kilonewtons. Um, that should be enough to, to adequately compress both sides as long as there's, as long as they're not already tightened down significantly. Um, once you have the reading about 20 kilonewtons, you can uh, tighten the anvils back in place. Uh, there's a few little set screws around, you just tighten those, make sure they're good and secure. Um, do that carefully though, mind you that there is, the mechanical system is, is on. So it's always, always gonna be careful when you have your hands anywhere, you know, near the inside of the tank when the mechanical system is on. Um, and then once you've tightened everything down, you can back the stroke back up. Um, you wanna do that slowly, back the force off, get it back to zero kilonewtons, and then remove your specimen removal tool and turn off your energy sources. Um, just a reminder, you do not want to you know, never, never place your hands between the, between the jaws with mechanical or air ram on. Um, that's the reason we use that tool right there. So just for your own safety, keep in mind that this not recommended ever. Um, so once you have your anvil assemblies as you want them and um, they're, they're loaded, they're in, reinstalled, they've been preloaded. Um, air and pressure is a consideration you wanna make uh, before running your tests. Make sure you have that where you want it. Um, at least in quite a few cases, um, the hydro wedge always uses air ram as part of the default program. Um, if you're using the pressure test adapter, uh, if you're doing higher strain rates, um, perhaps maybe using the uh, the four millimeter coupler or just decoupled. Um, obviously, air is necessary there to keep the sample secure between the anvils. Uh, if you're doing slow tests, then air this may not be applicable, but in any higher strain rate testing, air is used. So um, those kinds of scenarios, this is important. Um, the air pressure uh, in those scenarios is used to keep the sample in contact. Um, while allowing the stroke piston to back up and then accelerate into the sample, particularly in the case of the hydro wedge, where you're going potentially a lot faster. Um, air and pressure needs to be high enough to maintain adequate contact with the sample. Um, but the uh, on the other side of that, it needs to, you don't want so much that you're going to deform the sample. So, I mean, if, if you go up to you know, with a low carbon steel, maybe 1100 C, you still have ARAM on it at a half kilonewton, one kilonewton, you're going to see your jaw value decrease. Um, I, I've seen that many times. Um, so it needs to be kind of a balancing act between those, those two things. So um, it needs to maintain contact. If it's not enough contact, you will also see a lot of uh, variability in your heating. Um, so the ideal value for that is depends on sample geometry, um, testing temperature, material, et cetera. Um, but we recommend typically as a, a starting point, at least for flow stress testing, for uh, actual compression testing, somewhere between a half kilonewton to one kilonewton um, and see how that performs. You may need to add more or less. Uh, as I mentioned before, if, if ARAM is not if the air and pressure is uh, insufficient, you will have temperature oscillation, which you can see uh, in that graph down there on the bottom. Many of you have probably seen that. It's it's not always going to be the air. Maybe there's maybe it, the preloading wasn't um, adequate, uh, but you will certainly see uh, worse thermal control during the during the ramp if your air ram is not high enough um like i said before if, if it's too high though you will see your jaw reading actually decrease at those higher temperatures it's being the sample is deforming which 
will really affect your stream results. So those that will both be looked at essentially. Um, just a quick note, the HDS program will automatically shut off the ARM uh, at 1000 C during the ramp. Um, and the soak, it'll put it back on just before the hits to make sure sample doesn't disappear. Um, doesn't doesn't fall out of the anvils. So it'll it'll toggle it a lot during the test, during the deformations, but um, for ramp and soak above a thousand C, it shuts it off. Um, another concern, another consideration is uh, anvil cooling. Um, we typically will recommend uh, one GPM, one gallon per minute flow to both left and right side anvils or jaws. Um, for practically all testing, again, that's a baseline. Um, really what's more important is again that, that they're equal. So you want you want both sides to cool equal, or you're probably not going to have the thermal gradient that you want across the sample. Um, I wanted to mention that it may seem to be a, a good solution since we're concerned about thermal gradient introduced by the cooling at the jaws, um, some people may want to say, well, let's just shut off the cooling then, but that is not advisable in this or any scenario, really. Um, you, if you allow the whole jaw or anvil base to heat up to testing temperatures, you, you may cause damage to your seals or hardware, who, who knows what might happen from that. So it's never advisable to shut off cooling entirely. You just wanted to make that mention So um, I ran a few tests earlier this week, um, kind of a, a quick little optimization study, if you will, um, to see you know, what, what simple changes, as mentioned earlier in the, the uh, webinar, to see what effect they will have to see the capability to improve thermal gradient. Um, so I ran six tests in a hydro wedge standard flow stress program um, I removed the deformations, so there's no need for that. I'm just concerned about thermal gradient, really. Um, so that means that the program simply heated the sample to 1170C in five minutes, held for one minute, and that was it. Uh, I had a sample, uh, a thermocouple, the control thermocouple was in the center of sample, as is usual. I had a second thermocouple two millimeters from the left edge. And I did my best to hold uh, or to maintain uh, sample quality, vacuum, the air ram, um, nickel paste application, all those things as consistent as possible to try to, to isolate um, just the change that I was making. Um, so uh, what I ultimately changed, I started with uh, just a solid tungsten carbide anvil and then went to ISO T and then made some changes to the, the stack uh, to see the effect. The data I'm about to show is um, just from the one minute soak there at the end of the tests. So this was the first test. Um, again, with the solid tungsten carbide anvil, not ISO T, uh, at the interface, the sample anvil interface was just one piece of tantalum, nickel paste on both sides, that was it. Uh, as you can see, uh, TC2 is about 50 C lower during the soak roughly uh, than TC1. That's a pretty significant gradient. So that's kind of our, our starting point and we'll try to improve from there. So the next test was moving to ISO T, you're doing standard ISO T setup, standard, um, standard use of one piece of tantalum there at that anvil uh, sample interface. Again, nickel paste on both sides of that and see there's all there. You can see it's it's less than 10 C pretty much the entire time, but it's not very consistent, is it? It's it's cooling pretty much the entire time. Um, perhaps flattening out there at the end, but um, without testing longer, it's hard to say for sure. So still not really ideal. Uh, for the third test, I removed the well, I replaced the uh, one piece of tantalum at that anvil sample interface with one piece of graphite. Um, nickel pasted both sides, ran that. You can see the gradient is steadier, but it's back up to a much higher value. So again, not ideal. Um, this in particular, this, this, this one test is one that 
I'd be curious if I were running a more serious study, I would certainly rerun this some more, get more data, because this, this seems like more of an outlier than the rest of it, given the other data that I have here. Um, this one was pretty surprising. I then went to two pieces of, of graphite at that Anvil sample interface, and though it is a little more oscillatory early on, it stabilizes to around 12C. So, I mean, depending on what values is of value to you, that's perhaps, you know, somewhat on par with the ISO-T traditional setup with the, uh, with the one piece of tantalum. Uh, I then decided to tr see the combination of one piece of graphite and one piece of tantalum together at that interface and see what would happen. And there it increased back up to 20C again. So perhaps not the way to go, at least in my little study I ran here. Um, the final test that I ran was three pieces of uh, graphite at that interface, since it seemed like from one piece of graphite to two, the change was pretty significant. Um, so I figured perhaps three would be you know, the right approach. And three pieces of graphite at that anvil sample interface reduced it to an average perhaps 3C from you know, plus minus 10-ish in variable at the ISO-T anvil with tantalum or 50C with the uh, solid Clemson carbide anvil. Um, the point of showing this data is not to demonstrate, you know, that, that three pieces of graphite obviously is, you know, the perfect setup, surely can be improved more, um, but more so just to, to, to show that the effect of changing the, the stack and, you know, what can be done to improve it in that means. So not meant to be an end-all be-all by any means, um, simply a, a demonstration of the changes and the effects essentially, so. Um, the final point I wanted to bring up was uh, just a few quick good housekeeping measures. Um, the uniaxial compression testing gets very messy, and as any who run it know, their graphite gets everywhere. The nickel paste gets on the tank walls and all over your anvils and um, everywhere else. So, um, particularly in terms of vacuum performance, continued adequate performance, um, cleaning of the, the vacuum tank is very important. Um, it should be a regular part of preventive maintenance as it is, um, but even more important in this case, you're running a lot of these tests because of nickel paste, because of the graphite, um, it's going to make a mess of the tank over time. And so that should be routinely cleaned. Um, the anvil should be cleaned, the surfaces to ensure better uh, optimal contact essentially. Um, you, know, you can take that time and also just check and make sure they're not cracked. Um, kind of do two things at once right there. Um, but also clean the vacuum tank walls, nickel paste residue will be all over them, cleaning the anvil assemblies, the quench spray head if that's attached, um, any debris, like solid pieces of graphic that have fallen to the back of the chamber. Um, all those things should be removed, cleaned out routinely. <laughs> Otherwise, they're going to get end up getting sucked into the vacuum tank or, or um, fall down that tank drain hose and that's always fun to get it out of there um i would i would argue that this kind of testing is uh you know more problematic potentially for your vacuum unit than all other testing combined i mean my experience that that that's that's the case um and so for the sake of your vacuum um so as not to to lose time or money trying to resolve vacuum issues that are avoidable, you know, please take the time when doing these kind of tests to routinely clean your vacuum tank. Uh, your vacuum will thank you for it. I, I promise you that. Um, and with that, we'd like to thank you for watching and... Uh, great. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Brian, uh, for a great presentation. Uh, we do have a number of uh, questions that have been asked during uh, the presentation, a lot of really good questions. Uh, a couple of our guys, Brian, a pair of our Brian's have been working on them. Brian Smahoski and Brian Allen have been answering a lot of those questions directly in the chat. Um, if any of your questions have been answered, but you still have a follow-up question,
I'd ask that you make another note of that and we can address that now. Uh, but I did want to go back and maybe review a couple of the questions. One of the questions uh, revolved around the comparing induction heating uh, versus re resistance heating and, and which is better. And uh, Brian Allen did answer that in the chat. I uh, think it's a difficult question to answer. So maybe, uh, Brian, you can you can comment on that here. Yeah, I can comment on that, and I, I, I unfortunately won't have any like very simple, easy, straightforward answer for that. There are there are situations where the resistance heating is is going to be beneficial. There are situations where the induction heating can give you better thermal gradients and better results. So as we've kind of discussed uh, throughout this entire presentation, one of the big reasons that we see thermal gradients in the ISO T anvils, uh, I guess there's a couple reasons. One is that the, the anvils themselves will tend to pull heat out of the sample. So the anvils are being heated by the same resist by the same current that is heating the sample, but since they're different resistivity, they're different mass, they're they're different geometry, they're cooled differently, they're going to have a little bit different temperature than the actual sample. Uh, the other issue is that sometimes you get interfacial heating. Uh, Eric showed some graphs that showed a little bit of overheating uh, in the samples, a little bit of overshoot. And typically that is because you're getting some interfacial heating. So the, the interfacial resistance where the tantalum foil touches the anvil cap and then the, the sample, there's actually quite a bit of resistance at that interface. And that resistance depends on a lot of things, how much other lubricant you may have there, how much air and pressure you have. But if the resistance at those interfaces is is high enough that you actually generate a significant heat at those interfaces, you can actually heat the ends of the sample, heat those interfaces at a faster rate than you heat the bulk of the sample, and then you can get that, that resultant overshoot. Uh, one of the things you can do with induction is you can use different anvil materials that don't have the same thermal conductivity. One of the materials that we have available as anvils is, is quartz. So uh, the quartz has actually a very low thermal conductivity, so it's very thermally insulating. So you can heat the sample with induction uh, between a set of quartz anvils, and those quartz anvils don't pull very much heat out of the sample, and then you can actually get a, a quite good thermal gradient there. Now the limitation of the quartz anvils, of course, is their strength. So there, there are temperature limitations there, of course, as well, but usually with quartz, the, the biggest drawback is the strength. So again, depending on, you know how strong your sample is those quartz anvils you know may fracture when you're trying to do a a fast compression test uh, on a depending on what the sample is we have silicon nitride caps as well which are much stronger than the quartz but they also have a, a higher thermal conductivity now it's not as high as the as the thermal conductivity of the carbide that we use in the direct resistance setup, but the, the silicon nitride anvils, you know, will be strong enough to test most materials, but they will pull a little more heat out of the sample. Uh, the other issue with induction is that, you know, you kind of have to, to set up an induction coil for each different sample geometry that you use, whereas if you clamp a, a sample between uh, to resistance heated anvils, you can you can get away with a lot more different sample geometries using the same anvil setup. So uh, unfortunately, there are some drawbacks and some benefits to, to both setups, and it really comes down to what is the material, uh, what are you trying to achieve with your experiment, and uh, the other part of that is, is is heating rates. You know, as you saw in some of Eric's data, you know, sometimes if you heat very fast, you can get some overshoot that then turns into undershoot. Uh, and that will vary the amount of that depending on what setup you have. So, uh, unfortunately, it's a little complex problem, and there's there's no direct, straightforward answer to it. But certainly, uh, you know, we believe, and the reason that we brought out that product is that by offering our customers, you know, as many tools in their toolbox as we possibly can, that allows you to to select the right one uh, for your application. Although sometimes it's not immediately evident which is the right tool uh, before you try to just do some experiments and, and see which one works best. Great, thanks Brian. We also had a question about uh, relating uniaxial compression testing to plane strain, uh, knowing that this is a seminar or a conversation about uniaxial compression, but obviously plane strain is something that a lot of people are interested in. Uh, I'd like to bring in uh, Fulvio Siciliano, who is uh, one of our uh, rolling experts here at DSI and has a lot of experience with uh, both types of testing. So, Fulvio, I've 
Hoping you can address that question. I'm unmuting you. It looks like you are still on mute. Hi, guys. Uh, so this is, uh, well, thank you for this very uh, interesting question. Uh, we are talking about uniaxial compression, but well, where, when to consider going strain compression? Well, uh, firstly, uh, start in a very basic aspect. Uh, plain strain compression is very convenient uh, to test uh, sheet metal or let's say flat specimens. So this is a very basic uh, reason to use plain strain compression. Uh, if, we, if we see the geometrical aspects, uh, plain strain geometrically is much more close, uh, well, it's cl much closer to rolling. If you look at, the, let's say, on a, on a side view of the plain strain compression test, so we can see a very similar geometry of of the uh, of rolling practice. So in other in other words, we have two rolls pressing the material, and uh, in the plain strain compression test, we have the two anvils uh, pressing a flat material. So that this geometry uh, similarity, it's uh, well, this is very important. We can uh, we can get much closer to uh, to the rolling practice. So in other in other words. Uh, we have uh, the deformation uh, increments in only two directions. This is plain strain, so we have only on the on the long, longitudinal direction, like the rolling, and on on the thickness direction, uh, like such as rolling. So it's very close geometrically. Another point that can, uh, if you compare it to in the axial compression, is that the barreling uh, is minimized. So I think uh, Dr. Brian Allen. And uh, Mr. Eric Dates, they they uh, they touched the, the Berlin issue, but since it's a well, it's a flat specimen, we have this Berlin minimized, and we have let's say we have well the, the results are more let's say reliable when you compare to a rolling practice. And just reminding uh, both uh, well, plain strain compression, in axial compression, and rolling are pure shear. Uh, deformation. So the, there, uh, this is also another similarity. I think this is the basic, uh, basic reasons to use plain strain compression. Great, thank you, Fulvio. Uh, questions are coming in pretty quickly now. It looks like we won't be able to get to all of them. So what we can do is we can uh, compile these questions and get back to the group. I did also want to note that we will be following up with an email. Uh, we can share the presentation as a PDF. Uh, I believe this will also be available as a, a video uh, link somewhere, so you'll be able to watch this again uh, and then follow up with our team with any questions. Uh, there are, again, a lot of questions. What we can do is we will go through them and provide, again, by short answers, similar to how we're answering in the chat questions. But, of course, there's always uh, the service team. The service team has been uh, not able to travel, as everyone knows, uh, but they have been. they are available uh, for support remotely. Uh, answering questions, uh, I believe the email address is surveys, um, I'm sorry, service at gleeble.com, and that will automatically get sent to Brian Smahoski and his team uh, so they can address those questions. Um, we only have a few minutes left. Brian Smahoski, I'm going to unmute you, and, and Brian Allen. There are a handful of questions here, and again, uh, Brian's thank you for, for answering these things very quickly as, as we're going here. Um, we had, we had a lot of questions about temperature uniformity, both in the specimen and in, in the anvils. Looking here at a question, there's a question here about uh, when using joule heating, is it possible to perform a compression test at high temperatures and determine the adiabatic heating of the sample by avoiding cooling or heating of the sample during deformation? I'm going to put you guys on the spot and ask uh, Brian Allen or Brian Smosky if, if you're able to address that, uh, how we can measure adiabatic heating. Yeah, you can measure to some degree the adiabatic heating of the of the specimen just by looking at the temperature increase when you do that deformation. Uh, you know, you are continually losing heat both to the environment through radiation and to the uh, the anvils. So, uh, if you're interested in adiabatic heating, obviously the the faster you compress, I think the easier that will be to see, just because then your adiabatic heat will, you know, will be a bigger proportion of the of the heat generated in the sample over that 
you know, over that brief moment of deformation, uh, and you won't have so much noise from heat loss either to the animals or or to the environment. Uh, I don't know that we could say, you know, a, a precise, you know, energy number of joules of adiabatic heating that you're generating in a sample, but but you can definitely see the the adiabatic heating, and I think you could probably measure the adiabatic heating uh, between different materials and at least get a relative ranking uh, of the of the heating that you're seeing there. I'm not sure if that answers the question totally, but. Uh... Thanks, Brian. And I think Brian Smahoski, the next question uh, was about uh, for, given, for a given anvil configuration, will the temperature uniformity be better with eight millimeter diameter by 12 millimeter long specimens compared to 10 millimeter diameter and 15 millimeter long specimens? Are you able to address that? Sure. So um, with the standard ISO T flow stress anvils, uh, we will typically see a slightly uh, improved thermal gradient with the 10 millimeter by 15 millimeter uh, diameter long specimens. Um, however, we do have different anvil cap geometries available to accommodate uh, smaller size samples. So uh, with the smaller size sample on the standard ISO T flow stress anvils, we find that the gradient will be a little bit steeper across the sample, but by changing the anvil cap to a smaller diameter anvil cap, utilizing a ceramic ring that sits around it, you can certainly improve your thermal gradient across smaller samples. Great. Thank you, Brian. There was, so there's a lot of questions and, and knowing, hearing from customers over the past about, again, which anvils to use. Uh, so there was a question about, uh, for tests on aluminum, it was said that it is better to use the stainless steel base cylinder in the ISO-T. Can I also use the tungsten or tungsten carbide cylinders? What effect will the use of tungsten, tungsten carbide cylinders, have compared to stainless steel cylinders? Brian or Brian? Can I put you on the spot for that question? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the difference will be primarily in in the force that you need to resist when you do your deformation. So we don't sell a lot of stainless steel uh, anvil caps for steel testing just because you know the, the the strength difference between the stainless steel and the steel you're testing is probably not that great and you will will typically could see some deformation in the anvil cap itself and that's really why we use the the tungsten carbide is just to get that high temperature strength that you need for for a, a fast hard deformation at a high temperature you know on a, a steel sample uh, I think Eric did mention that the stainless steel anvils uh, can work quite well with the aluminum and that's just simply due to the the resistance balance there the the stainless steel has a higher resistance uh, to electrical electrical resistance, I should specify, and so they get they get warm enough to give you a good thermal gradient in aluminum under the current that's used to heat aluminum. And given that they're stronger than aluminum at temperatures where you would typically be testing aluminum, they're they're sufficient for for that testing and they they work quite well. I certainly couldn't recommend stainless steel for testing. Uh, steel samples. Uh, we typically only use the pure tungsten anvils at very high temperatures. Uh, tungsten carbide, tool, tooling grade tungsten carbide is a is a combination of tungsten carbide and cobalt that actually forms a eutectic uh, a little over 1,200 C. So once you get above, you know, 1,000 or 1,100 C, you get to the point where you could get enough interfacial heating uh, you know through the lubricant barriers that you're using to to get the surface of that carbide above that eutectic barrier and you can start to see quite a bit of deformation on those tungsten carbide anvils at those temperatures uh, below those temperatures they're much stronger and harder than pure tungsten so they have less wear and and will last much longer uh, above that temperature we would we would switch out to the pure tungsten great thank you Brian so we are out of time. We do want to be respectful of every respectful of everyone's time and end within an hour. Uh, there are a couple questions here about uh, just compiling these questions, answering them, and getting them out. We will do that. The system, the webinar system, should send out an automatic email shortly. We'll also follow up with another email with a link to the presentation as a PDF, as well as uh, answers to some of these questions uh, or all these questions that haven't been answered here. Uh, Finally, there will also be a link to the survey. As I mentioned before, we want to know what you all want to hear about. 
in the next webinar series and future webinar series. So uh, let us know if you have, if it's a brief survey, please fill that out. Let us know what you want us to, to talk about and we're happy to do that. And with that, I'll conclude this webinar. And I wanna really thank everyone for spending time with us and hope everyone stays safe and healthy and, and sane as we all work from home and, and deal with uh, this pandemic. But thanks everyone for your time. We appreciate it.